morning, everybody. Man, what a fantastic day it's already been in worship. And if we haven't met, I know I was just baptized a second ago, but maybe I haven't even introduced myself. My name is Kyle McGinnity, and I'm the pastor here at New Point. We're so glad that you all are here. I also want to welcome everybody who's watching online today. And uh, you all picked a great Sunday to be in church because we get to kick off a brand new series that we're calling Marriage Tune-Up. Marriage Tune-Up. Now, um, Yeah, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about marriage, but in general, we're going to be talking about relationships. And so if you're, whether you're, you're uh, married or not, or you're in a relationship or you're dating or you're engaged, or maybe you're looking at some point to get into a relationship, there's going to be principles and there's going to be things that you can learn now from this series. And so this series is for everybody, even though we are going to be talking about marriage, uh, marriage specifically, but in general, relationships. And so here's what I want to do. I want to draw some attention, though, to your bulletin. So if you didn't get a bulletin, I want you to wave your hand in the air and our usher, Tucker, is going to... So put your hand up. Tucker's going to glance and get some people some bulletins real quick because we got one couple over here okay so just keep them up Tucker's gonna find you but here's the reason why so in your bulletin are all the announcements and I'm gonna explain what they are okay so one of the first ones on the on the front page we are gonna be giving away we're gonna be giving away a couple of date night prize packages so it's gonna be it's gonna be um I don't exactly know what it is, so I I can't describe it. But we're going to be giving it to you so you and your significant other can go uh, on an expense-paid, all-expense-paid prize package date night, okay? We want to do that. We're going to be drawing those in two weeks. So you have three weeks to register. Today and the next two weeks you can register. And here's how you register. Sorry, people online. you got to be in the building to register. But you, in the bulletin at the bottom, there'll be a little flap here you see. And I want you to write your info there, tear it off. And then when the offering bucket was passed, go back in time, okay? Drop it in the offering bucket. Now, there, there's one final way that you can do it, okay? On the walls by the door are our offering boxes. So keep it, keep it out. And on your way out, drop it in one of those boxes over there. Every week, each person can register one time. So you can have up to three registrations. And then at the final, uh, on the 21st, we're going to draw for those for that, for that giveaway. Okay? Sound good? It's going to be fun. We're going to give that to you. Um, a couple other things I want to mention is, uh, we'll put them up on the screen. We've got a couple of date night ideas for you. Coming up this Friday and next Friday, we, uh, as a staff, have kind of, we, we're like, all right, what, how can we plan maybe some fun date nights that couples can go on? We're not going to pay for you. We're just suggesting these and other couples are going to gather, so it'll be a fun time, okay? So, and, uh, so the first one coming up this Friday, coffee and axes. I could better say that correctly, okay? Axes. We, we're going to go ha- hang out at Provisions Coffee House as well as right next door, I think, is a place called The Axe Hole, okay? Whew. Thank you, Lord, for protecting me. All right. <laughs> so, fun date night idea. We're going to be there this Friday, and then next Friday, we're going to host a movie night and uh, for, for a movie and playing cornhole right here at the church. And so um, if you're married, dating, engaged, or you just want to ask somebody else on a date, here's a couple of great ideas. Come join us this Friday and next Friday. Got it? All right. I, I, we're, we're still debating on the movie, okay? Still debating on the movie. It'll be a surprise. Um, so come check that out the next couple of Weeks And uh, one final thing that I w- did want to mention, coming up on November 21st is a service, uh, a part of a service that we do once a year, and it's called our Parent Child Dedication Sunday. We believe that children are a gift and a blessing from the Lord. And so we want to provide an opportunity for every parent, every family to, to really set their families and set their kids apart to honor God. And so what that is, it's a time of dedication where parents gather with their children. And we, it's, a, it's a small portion of our service, about 10 minutes, where we gather the parents and children up front who haven't dedicated maybe a new baby or maybe haven't dedicated their family or their children at all. So we have anywhere from brand new babies all the way up through teenagers sometimes that parents are like, hey, I've never done that. I want to set my family apart. I want to honor God with my family. And so this is a public commitment saying, I'm going to honor God by raising my children to pursue God themselves. And so that's what it is. So we, we don't baptize babies here at New Point, but we do dedicate them and set them apart and pray over them so that one day they might come 
to follow Jesus and, and know him. Okay, So we have that coming up on the 21st. So in your bulletin, there's a little handout right here. Front side's more information. The back side's how you register. You can register here or online or on our church app, okay? But we really need you to register by the end of the day next Sunday so we can make sure we make plans for, for that. So if you know anybody that's not here today, please spread the word to them, okay? All right, is that enough announcements? We got a lot of stuff. However, they're, they're fun. So we're, we got those giveaways and date nights and all of that, okay? So let's dive in today to week one of our Marriage Tune-Up series, week one, week one. So, and now some of you are like, now I know why my spouse brought me today, <laughs> right? Oh, man. Well, every time I preach on marriage, I'm guaranteed that some people are going to love me and some people are going to hate me. So I, I just have to press on through that, okay? Here, here's my goal, though. In this series, I want, I want to give hope. I want to give hope to any relationship that's struggling. And honestly, every relationship goes through struggles, goes through difficulties, some really hard times. And so I want to give hope to you as much as I also want to give practical advice on how to really pursue God with your relationship. And, um, and so that's why we're doing this series. Um, how, many of you, uh, how many of you like a new car sometimes? Like what I mean by that is everybody like a new car. But how many of you like the, the, uh, the experience of hopping in a new car for the first time? Like it's nice and clean, it smells good, it's got that new car smell for a reason, um, and, and, and like it's all polished, the wheels are shining, you can see yourself in them. I don't know what that's like, but I bet it's pretty nice, okay? Now, for those of us that have, a new, that, that have gotten a new car, or like me, a new-to-you car, right, um, it's an awesome experience. But as you know, as soon as you drive it around for a week or for a month, it doesn't smell the same, right? And pretty soon, you've got fries in the floorboard. It rained as soon as you got it off the parking lot, so you got spots and dirt all over your car, and it's just not the same anymore. Not only that, is as you drive it over time, what naturally happens is the miles tick up. It's going to need some regular maintenance. It's going to need oil changes, tires rotated, wipers replaced, etc. And, and you, I mean, naturally, we expect that a little regular maintenance, maintenance is normal. If we want the car to last, we're going we're gonna to maintain the car. Now, there, there are some of you, however, <laughs> some people in our world, rather than want to go through the regular maintenance, they will just return the car or they'll trade it in for a new model, right? Anybody ever do that? Like, you, 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 like they'll, they'll drive a new car until it's the time for the first oil change, and they'll go back to the dealer and say, ah, I think I want, a, I think I want a newer model. And, and you know what we call those people? Crazy. <laughs> crazy. I'll just say it. We call them crazy. A little regular maintenance ought to be expected. But here's what I think. I think in our culture, in our society, in our world today, I think there are many people that do the same thing when it comes to relationships. I think it happens in marriages that at some point, rather than working on their relationship, they would rather trade up or trade in for a newer model. We see this all the time. I, I remember when I was a youth pastor for 10 years, I remember hearing about like sixth and seventh grade students talking about, oh, that's my ex. Well, that's my next girlfriend or my next boyfriend. And like it, it permeates our culture. Like you can start a relationship and stop a relationship, jump in and jump out anytime you want. You can trade in, trade out. The problem is just like you get a new car when you trade in, at some point it's going to need maintenance too. And you can just keep the cycle if you want, but there'll be nothing different. The same thing about relationships. If we don't learn that a little regular maintenance or a little tune-up every now and then is a good thing. It's a good thing. Did you know Oklahoma, stats as of this year, Oklahoma has the second highest divorce rate in the nation. In the nation. One out of every 10 marriages in Oklahoma will divorce this year. One out of every 10. And so in our congregation, we've got more than 10 marriages. And so there'll be, there'll be several, probably dozen marriages that, or, or a dozen marriages that, that might break it off this year. Because uh, it seems like, for whatever reason, the divorce rate in the church and outside the church are relatively about the same. What that tells me is that I'm in the right place <laughs> for a marriage series. 
We need to learn how to tune up our marriages. Because if we don't, there's disaster waiting. There's disaster waiting. What I mean by tune-up is this. A tune-up is that we expect that it's going to need maintenance. That's what you got to understand. You expect that there's going to be arguments and difficulties and money problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You expect that, but you know how to deal with it when it comes. That's what I want us to get good at. That's what I want us to get good at because there is no such thing as a perfect relationship. There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. I don't care what you see on Instagram or on television. That's not real life. Real life marriages are hard. And if you want them to be good, you got to be willing to put in the work. Are you willing to put in the work today? I want to give you hope for that. And here's the thing, just like you can't ignore the problems in your, in your car and think that it's going to get better, you can't ignore the problems in your marriage thinking it's going to get better. They need our attention. So um, I, I, just this past year, I remember several times I've gotten coupons in the mail Coupons in the mail for a free multi-point inspection. Anybody ever get those? Your free multi-point inspection. What that is, is you go to the dealership and you put the, you give them this coupon and basically they, they tell you that you need work on your vehicle. Okay, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just inevitable, right? But it's a good thing because hopefully if they're doing their job right, and I, I pray that they do, that they're looking through every system and everything in your vehicle. They're checking everything. And, and, and they'll, they'll diagnose a few of the different problems and say, okay, this needs replaced, this needs maintenance, um, and, and they'll go through this multi-point inspection and kind of give you a report. What this series, what I want to do is I want to do a multi-point marriage inspection. I want us to look at our marriage from a few different angles, and I want us to begin to diagnose and look at some of the things that we need to work on individually and as couples, a multi point inspection. So today, the title of the message, week one, is Check the Gauges. Check the Gauges, okay? So picture, picture with me, you're in your car, you've got the dashboard, right? And on the dashboard, there are gauges. There's a fuel gauge, there's a temperature gauge, there's a, there's a uh, speedometer, there's all kinds of gauges on there. And the purpose of those gauges is that they, they, they help you to monitor the status of your vehicle Real lifetime, okay? They help you to monitor that. But there's not only gauges on the dashboard of your vehicle. Some of you are like, there's gauges on my vehicle? I never knew that. There are. This next one's pretty important to pay attention to. Just like there's gauges, there's also lights. Specifically, there are warning lights that will go off when something is in need of immediate attention. Your, your car's overheating or, or maybe you need an oil change or whatever, um, there, there are warning lights that go off. And how many of you know you have an option at that point? <laughs> you can ignore it like it's not there. Or if you're like some people who get annoyed by the warning light, they'll take a piece of tape and tape it over there, or they'll put a picture over it, and they'll just ignore that it's there, right? What happens if you ignore or you cover over a warning light? Nothing good. Nothing good. You're just going to cause your... You may, you may not have to deal with the pain now, but you're going to actually deal with pain later if you don't maintain your vehicle. And the worst of them is that check engine light. I remember for a long time, my, my check engine light on my truck was going off and I ignored it over and over again. I ignored the knocking in my engine over and over again. And eventually, long story short, I was stranded on the side of the road, had to have my car towed and had to put a brand new engine in my vehicle. Because you can't just ignore it. See, here's the thing. The central, most important piece of your vehicle is the engine. You can kind of talk about car designers, and they talk about like, like the exterior, making them beautiful, making them slim, and slim line, making them attractive. But the reality is none of that matters if you can't fit an engine in it. And so they really begin to build from the inside out because the engine has to be there. It's the most important piece. And if the engine isn't in working right, then nothing works right. Like you can have bad paint, bad design, bad windshield wipers. Your tires can be out of balance. It doesn't matter. Uh, but but you, can, you can drive with that. But you can't drive without an engine. Without an engine working properly, you can't drive. It is a central piece. And so here's where I want to get today. What is the most, the most important, the most central piece to your marriage? Here's what it is. Here's the, the, the key today. It is your personal pursuit of God. 
your personal pursuit of God. I want to flip over to something that Jesus talked about. It's a, it's a parable. It's an example that he told in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 today. I want to look at this for a moment. Jesus has gathered his disciples together, and he's beginning to talk to them about who are the real followers, who are the true disciples, what, what does their life look like. And he's going to give us a really familiar parable where he compares a wise person and a foolish person. Now, off the top, we would all like to place ourselves in the wise category, correct? That's who we think we are. But I think this is a good litmus test, a good gauge to determine whether we really are as wise as we like to say that we are. Most of the time we're not. So here's what he says in chapter 7, verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because its foundation, it had its foundation where? On the rock. On the rock. So it gives us illustration. There's, there's one guy, he's going to build, and he builds his house on a steady, firm foundation, and no matter what comes against that house, it stands. And he gives a second illustration, a second scenario. Look at this, verse 26. He says, but... Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house and fell with a great crash. Let's just acknowledge something about what Jesus is talking about. The scenarios are exactly the same. What I mean by that, both situations experience difficult trials, they, the wind and the rain and, 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 and all of that, the flooding, it came to both equally. Let me tell you this, your life and your relationships, it is impossible to avoid trials. It is impossible to avoid arguments. It is impossible to avoid temptation. It is impossible to avoid problems. They will come equally to all people. The difference is, what is your life built upon? That will determine whether you stand or fall. And what Jesus says is he says, me and my word are the firm foundation that will keep you standing no matter what comes. What is your relationship built around? What is it built upon? Here's what I believe. I believe every relationship in general, every relationship starts out being built around either someone or something. Someone or something. I'm going to draw today a little bit, illustrate this. All right? So, someone. So, it's either me <laughs> or you. Like, our relationships at some point, we, we may start a relationship, and, and, and in the beginning, maybe it's built around me. Like, I get into a relationship, dating relationship, engaged, married, whatever it is, I get in a relationship because I want it. I need it. I want to feel fulfilled. I want to feel wanted. I want to feel attractive. I want to feel special. I want someone to meet my needs, whether it's physically, emotionally, sexually. I want someone to help with finances. <laughs> whatever it is, sometimes relationships can be built around someone. Now, that someone can also be the other person. Some of you are in a one-way relationship where everything about your relationship is focused on them. They always make it about them. Everything is based on them. And in the beginning, it's not a big deal because honestly, your attraction and your affection for them overcomes the fact that your relationship is built around them. But when that attraction and that affection begins to waver and you realize it's only always about them, that's when you begin to have some issues. And so at some, some, some of us, our relationships start out and they're built around someone. If you get that, nod your head. Yes. Yep. Okay. Now, the other thing sometimes, it's built around something. So this can be, you, you, you can put up their money. You can put up their affection. You can put up their um, attraction or sex. 
You can put up there um, just, just a numerous things that your, your relationship could built a, be built around something. It, it could be built around companionship. It can be built around your own, uh, around happiness. It can be built around things that you do together, activities. Your relationship could be even built around, and this one is one that happens a lot, built around kids. Something. Someone or something. Now, these are good things. Relation, everything I mentioned is not a bad thing per se. But when those things are the main thing that your relationship is built around, you can be sure that at some point your relationship will falter. It's not going to be able to stand the test of time. It may be good at times, it may be good at the beginning, but at some point, everything, someone or something, if you've built it around those things, they will falter and they will fail. And you're going to be looking for a newer model. You're going to be looking to replace what you got in hopes that there's something better out there. The reality is, if you continue to build this way, you're going to continue to get the same results. At some point, your marriage or your relationship won't be as happy as it was in the beginning. Like you go through ups and downs in your relationship. Let's just be honest. That happens. Even in the best marriages, you go through times where, where you don't feel as happy. Or maybe you, you struggle with compatibility. Like in the beginning, you thought you were super compatible. And then you get married and you start living together and you realize, I got into something I didn't know I was getting into, right? That person has the worst living habits and you didn't know it, but now you do, and you're like, what do I do? I based our relationship on compatibility, and now we're not even compatible at all. We don't even like the same Netflix shows. What are we going to do? At some point, compatibility is going to fail you. Let's be real. Those of us that are maybe going through a midlife crisis, um, your looks are going to fade, fade <laughs> at some point, right? Your, your looks are going to fail you. Your romance is going to fail you. Your sex life is going to go through times where it's maybe not as good or as exciting as it was. Money problems are going to come. And even if you base your life on your, your kids, at some point your kids, God willing, are going to grow up and move out. And then what happens? If your life was built around them, and this is one of the largest struggles that older parents have, is they don't know what to do with their life because they built their life around their kids, their kids' activities, their kids' stuff. And that was what they had in common as a couple. We always just do kid stuff together. But now what do we do? And they're having to relearn how to date each other. I'm trying to tell you, don't wait until that happens. Don't build your relationship this way. There's one way that you can build your relationship that matters. And that's around a personal pursuit of God, a relationship with God, with God at the center. Here's the main idea I want you to write down today. The main idea is this, for your relationship to be good, God must be under the hood. You like that? When my wife watches this sermon back, she's going to make fun of me. Hey, I want you to remember that. For your relationship to be good, God must be where? There you go. See? Stupid work sometimes. Here's what I've discovered. Most marriage problems are not really marriage problems. They're God problems. Most marriage problems are not really marriage problems. They are God problems. They can be traced back to a problem or relationship bet between one or the other spouses or one or the other people in the relationship and their relationship with God. Sometimes it's both. Both are not, God is not the center of their life. I'm going to X through these. These are ones we don't want, right? We're going to base our relationship with God. And they can be based around like, like at some point, if one or both of your relationship or your, your marriage or relationship or your life, God is not the center of it, your pursuit of God is not, then, then you're going to have struggles. Um, I, I remember in marriage counseling, I do a lot of marriage counseling, and we do this triangle, and this is um, me and my spouse, okay, and God, right? The goal is that as I pursue God and my spouse pursues God, then the distance between us gets closer. That's the goal. When God, we've built our life around God, 
We don't build our life around our spouse. We build our life along, around God. And as we pursue God together, see, it doesn't work if only one person pursues God because you're still distanced. But when both of you pursue God together, the more you fall in love with God, I guarantee you the more you'll fall in love with your spouse. I've personally witnessed this in my own life. My marriage struggles are a direct result of my personal lacking in my personal relationship with God or Cheyenne's lacking in her personal relationship with God or both of us. If God's not the foundation, you are going to have struggles. It's the place to start. It's the place to start today. Now, I want you to think back to dashboards, right, for a second, and the gauges you have, and the warning lights going off. The warning lights aren't the problem, right? When you see the warning lights, you can cover it up. You fix the symptom, but you didn't fix the problem. The same thing is true in marriage. Like, there are warning lights that are going off in our marriages, in our relationships all the time. And sometimes we'll give that attention but really what that is, it's a, it's a symptom of a deeper problem in our life. It's a symptom. So there are warning lights in our relationships. Let me just be honest with, with you. Some of them I struggle with, some of them you struggle with, but lack of communication, it's a warning light. Lack of, uh, uh, how, about, how about selfishness? Pride, more and more arguments and fights and disagreements, unresolved tension, you know what that feels like? Hurtful words, money problems. These are all symptoms. These are all warning lights that are going off. A lack of intimacy, maybe a lack of sex, lying, or even cheating. Like, like all of these, they are serious problems in themselves, but they're not the main problem. All of these are symptoms of a deeper issue, and they all have their root in that failed relationship with God. Let me, let me show you in Scripture where we see this. In John chapter 15, Jesus gives us some great truths and insight to life. Here's what he says in John 15, 1. He says about himself, he says, I am the true vine. Talking about Jesus. I am the true vine and my father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because I say this. Now skip on down to verse 4 for a second. He says, remain in me. I want you to say that for a second. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's a life truth that we have to understand. Jesus used the illustration of the foundation and the wise and foolish builders, and now he's using the illustration of, of a vine and the fruit of the vine. It's the same teaching, it's just a different illustration, a different way to look at it. And what he says is that for us to produce spiritual, relational, healthy fruit in life and in our relationships, there's only one vine we've, we can tap into. There's only one place. It's the same illustration here. Only God, only a pursuit of God, only a relationship with God is, is going to produce the fruit that we need in our life to have a healthy relationship. So what, what is the fruit of a relationship with God? What is the fruit? What does it produce when I pursue God? What is it doing in me? And what does it produce in my relationship? Listen to this, Galatians 5 22. Paul says this. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, you've heard this, is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I could write down these are goals of my marriage. Now, wouldn't you love it if your marriage was characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Wouldn't, wouldn't you love your relationships to be characterized by that? And I would. <laughs> I'm convicted reading through that because I know that there's some of those that are really lacking in my own life. And I'm to blame. 
I'm to blame. See, what happens is when, when people, when we base our relationships in marriage where God is not the center, for a time what we do is we play an imitation game. We try to produce fake fruit when we don't really have the roots. And at some point, that fruit's going to wither and die because there's no constant source for it to grow from. The only source that you can produce fruit of, of this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc., the only fruit, it comes out of a relationship of pursuing God. And then it flows out into growth in other areas, in other relationships. I say it this way for you to remember, your roots determine the fruits. Your roots determine the fruits. So, we've hit this topic. We know what it is, that, that, that God must be the foundation. God must be under the hood for our relationship to be good. We, we must pursue God. Like, marriage problems are not marriage problems, they're God problems. Like, we've said it over and over again. And for some of us, we're like, well, great. <laughs> I, that's where I'm at, but there's no hope for me. What am I supposed to do now? Where am I supposed to go? I want to say this. That if you have those warning signs in your relationship or in your life, which you do, it's not a bad thing. The dashboard, the warning lights, the check engine light, they are there for a reason. Because they are expected to go off at some point in time, right? You just expect that. You expect that there needs to be a tune-up. You expect that there needs to be a regular oil change and tire replaced and, and, and rotated and etc. Like we expect it. In your marriage, I want you to realize that the warning signs aren't a sign that it's all over. The warning signs are a sign that it's time for a tune-up. It's time to take action. And there's hope in that. Here's what I realize about my own relationship and about all marriages. Marriage is a tool that God uses for our transformation. I know you know this, but you're not everything God wants you to be yet. You're not everything God wants you to be yet. And what God wants to do is He wants to use your marriage, no matter how many bells and whistles and warning signs are going off, He wants to use it as a tool for your transformation into the likeness and the look and the attitude of the fruits of the Spirit, and to look more and more like Jesus every day. That's what he wants. Marriage is, a, here's another way I'd put it, marriage is like a magnifying glass to our life. It's like a magnifying glass to our life, because most of our marriage problems that we have, they weren't created by our marriage. It only, our, our marriage only amplified that a, pro, a problem already existed before we got together. Like, we already, before we get into a relationship, we already struggle with selfishness, with pride, with sexual immorality, with marriage problems, with poor conflict resolution issues, with unforgiveness, with hurts. I could go on and on, but I'm not describing marriage problems. I'm actually just describing personal problems. And so often we think that by getting into a relationship with someone and we make them the center of our life, that, that at some point that, that those things are going to go away. But all it does is cover up the symptoms for a while, but there's a deeper issue that you have. See, marriage doesn't create the problem. It only amplifies the problems that are already there. And you are, you, here's the thing, God uses it, marriage, for that purpose. God uses marriage to make you holy more importantly than make you happy. Listen, your relationship is a tool that God wants to use to mold you and mend you and heal you and make you look more and more like Christ, to make you more loving, more forgiving, more soft-hearted, more generous, more kind, more faithful, etc. He wants to do that, but sometimes we don't need, know we need that until we entered into a relationship and we're like, I got issues, <laughs> Right? Like your marriage turns a magnifying glass on your own life and you've got a choice. Ignore it or allow God to bring transformation through it. So what's your next step? I want to say this, your next step. How, how do I, how, where do I start? What do I, what do I do? For those of you, I'll say this, that are single. You're single, you're engaged, you're dating, either one of those situations. Here's what my suggestion is to you, my question. Is the pursuit of God the center of your life? Right now, 
single, dating, engaged. Is the pursuit of God what your life is built around? Or have you made a relationship or the hope of a relationship or the desire for a relationship or the other person or something about that person? Have you made that the center of your life? Because remember, marriage won't fix your issues. It'll only amplify them. So if you've got issues of pursuing God now, they will not automatically get better when you get married. Oh, I'm going to be more faithful. I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more generous. No, you won't. (laughs) It doesn't happen like that. Yes, marriage is a tool to bring out transformation, but I want to save you some pain now by working on those things before you get into a relationship. So, is God the driving force of your life? For those of us that are married or in a relationship, what do you do? When you discover that you or your spouse, you've got some work to do, what do you do? I'm going to say this. Start with you and take the next step. Don't worry about your spouse and what they're doing. I'm going to say start with you. Start with you. And when you begin to take next steps of transformation in your own personal life, it will only, only increase your chances of having a healthy relationship. Now, ultimately, both of you need to do that, but it starts with you. You're never going to push your spouse to pursue God. It doesn't happen that way, right? You can't push them into loving God. You can't push them into wanting God. But guess what? It's not your job to do that. God is way bigger than you, husband or wife. God is way bigger and can do way more through the work of the Holy Spirit than you could ever dream or imagine. So just trust Him and work on you. Trust Him and work on you. So I'm going to give you some practical next steps. Here's what they are. Start practicing these things. First thing is this. Daily, daily, read my Bible and pray. Where do I start? Daily, read my Bible and pray. Here's what I found out in my own life, that the Bible is a gauge. It is a, it is a gauge for my life. It's something that God uses to bring transformation in me. The, the Bible, I've heard it say this, it, it's, it's the only book that, that when you read it, it reads you. When you read it, it reads you. It looks at your life. Read your Bible and pray daily. Start that habit. If you miss a day, don't miss two. If you need a Bible, if you don't know where to start, we want to help you with that. Come and talk to me or Cody or any of our staff or anybody, your small group leader. Read your Bible and pray daily. Make it a habit. And God will use that to transform you as well. Here's the second thing. Weekly, so daily read my Bible and pray. Weekly, go to church and worship. Weekly, go to church and worship. Here's the thing. There's a recent study out there that says church attendance in itself, just church attendance, decreases divorce up to 50%. That's a recent study. Here's what I think. I think sometimes we just need to start taking practical steps. You may not always feel like going to church. You may not always feel like worshiping, and I get it. You think I feel like going to church and worshiping every day of every, every time like it comes? No, I don't. I'm the pastor here, right? There's some mornings I wake up and I'm like, I don't want to have to drag my kids here. And honestly, my wife is the one who does it most Sundays. And so she's probably thinking the same thing. But here's what we realize. That when we build our life around the routine of not only church attendance, but worship, we experience transformation. And our relationship is better. So here's what I got to say. These simple daily and weekly practices, Bible, pray, church, and when you're here, don't waste your time. Actually engage in worship. Engage in responding to the message. Engage in hearing from the Word and taking notes. Engage because that's where life change happens is when you engage. So these are the things to start today. Here's all I want everybody to do around the room. We're going to stand. I want to respond to God in this moment. We're going to stand. And as you stand, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. There's some of you here today in this room that your check engine light is on. It's on. 
(laughs) For some of you, your entire dashboard is lit up. But I want to tell you, it's okay. The purpose of the lights are so that you will address what needs to be addressed. And today is an opportunity for you to take a next step. Honestly, this this message series is going to open up the lines of communication between you and your significant other or you and your spouse. It's an opportunity for you to begin to engage each other. Next week, I'm going to be talking about communication. I'm going to be talking about how to have difficult conversations. But today, what I want you to do is I want you to do you. I want you to work on you. I want you to take a next step, whatever that looks like. Begin to make a commitment to do that. Our Heavenly Father, today, as we respond to you, God, we recognize that you are the most important piece to our life. And God, you are the most important piece to our relationships. God, Today, those of us that know you, we renew our relationship with you right now in this moment. God, we want to place you on the altar of our life. God, we want to make you the most important thing. And Father, we pray that as you are the vine, God, I pray that that we will bear the fruit of being found in you. God, I pray that as we dig into you, we, we, will, we will be transformed, that we will be more kind and compassionate. We'll have love, joy, peace. These will characterize our relationships, patience, goodness, gentleness, self-control. God, we will be transformed. We pray for that to happen and to come out in the fruit of our life. God, transform us as we abide in you. It starts right here and right now. As you continue with your heads bowed and eyes closed for one moment, there's some here in this room, there's some of you watching online that your starting point to a better relationship with God is actually just starting a relationship with God. And today I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What I mean by that is we need a Savior. There is sin in our life that separates us from our Creator. And Jesus came as our Savior. He paid the price and the penalty for our sin by dying on the cross. And he rose again three days later from the tomb, proving his ability to forgive sin, to overcome death, hell, and Satan forever, and to give us new life and a right relationship with the Heavenly Father. Jesus did that for you. He wants to give you eternal life and new life today, right here, right now. He wants to indwell you with his Holy Spirit and empower you to live for him, to make you brand new. If you're wanting that today, I'm going to lead you through a simple prayer. A simple prayer to just acknowledge Jesus as your personal Savior and make Him Lord and Master of your life today. If you're ready to do that, pray with me in this moment. Let's pray together. Dear God, I know you created me and you love me. But God, I have sin in my life and I need your forgiveness. I believe in Jesus. Jesus, I believe you died for me and you rose again for me. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. Adopt me into your family. Give me a home and eternal life in heaven. But God, transform my life today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you from this moment forward. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate those who made that decision.